Tuesday. Let's call the Board of Elections meeting for Tuesday, May 11th to order at uh, 1.03 p.m. And uh, if there's anybody here for public comment, uh, now would be a great time to address the board. Is there anybody who wishes to address the board? Well, we will have the opportunity under the uh, under the uh, the uh, new business if anybody comes up with another uh, another reason to address. All right, let's move ahead to consideration of the uh, uh, minutes of the Board of Elections meeting held on Thursday, April 29th. Is there a motion to approve? I'll make the motion. Second. It properly moved and seconded. Any other additions, discussions, or corrections to those minutes? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Unanimously approved. Okay, under new business, we have uh, three items. Uh, who would like to uh, address them in the order in which they, they're pre uh, presented on the agenda? Sure. So we had a good discussion uh, last week regarding just some informational background on each of these, but essentially the whole th the whole reason why, why we're discussing these and, and hope, hopefully going to take some positions on these is that to get some get some uh, better guidance and uh, just just uh, procedures in place so that after the election we're not making some of these decisions uh, we we have them more squared away at this point. Uh, and then also there's some, we just want to make sure we're all on the same page about what's happening in the vote by mail processing room. Um, we, we had some, uh, the communication wasn't as great as it could have been after the general election last year. And so we're just trying to front load some of those decisions at this point. So we all understand where we're at. Um, I don't know, Betsy, if there's anything you would want to go over in a quick way, but we're essentially going to be looking at just making sure that we're okay to still do some of the things we did last year when it comes to voters uh, signing their ballots that might have, not have signatures on it before election day. Uh, and then in terms of what's gonna happen at some of the polling locations regarding provisional ballots, uh, also looking at the vote by mail room again, what that's gonna look like. Uh, and then some, some of the ballot situations that we may have with the vote by mail, talking about some of those uh, different ones. So I don't know if there's any general things that you wanted to talk about Betsy before we start to run through some of these. Betsy, do you have any comment? No, I don't think I have anything generally to say. I think we can address them as we talk through the issues. Okay. All right, let's begin with uh, number or letter A, which is uh, procedures for voters to correct their vote, vote by mail ballot envelopes at the Willowbank office building. Yeah, so this is essentially was, we, we did a, about two, three weeks uh, before, yeah, actually it was even a month, a month before, I think, but sometime in, in early October, of last year, we basically said, if somebody doesn't sign their ballot, put their printed name, address, or date on it, that we would reach out to them via letter, email, whatever contact we had, letting them know that and if they wanted to come in to fix that, they could do so. And all they needed to do was bring their identification with them and they could resolve this. The ballot, thankfully, the outer envelope has been simplified this year where it does not have the, you don't need to print your name or, or, or uh, or put your address, you literally just sign and date it. So that's helpful. And also they changed the date to today's date, which will help when people are putting their birth dates or anything like that. Uh, so uh, essentially it would be, are we still okay with reaching out to voters saying to them, if you wanna come to the elections office by eight o'clock on elections day to sign your ballot and date your ballot um, because you didn't do it, uh, we'd be happy to accommodate. Um, and uh, I think Tisha was saying that we're getting a few. We're not getting many, but we are getting a few. Is that still true, Tisha? Yeah, I mean, if we have 25, that's a lot. I, I see them in little amounts, so we're obviously keeping them somewhere else under lock and key. Um, but there's not excessive amounts up to this point. Okay, so that would be the first decision. Do we Do we reach out to these voters to say, come on in and fix your, and, and um, sign your ballot or date your ballot. Betsy, are you still in concurrence with this action? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure that even the dating is required. Um, I think the question for you as the board is, and again, you're not gonna be looking at these as they come in, but 
when I look at both the guidance and what's out there, it's it, it's it's your decision that you are satisfied, when I say you're, the board's decision that you are satisfied that the declaration is sufficient. But in order to get to that point, the signature is predicate, right? So if the outside of the envelope is signed, the rest of the issues are yours to determine in, in terms of the outside declaration. So, I mean, I don't think there's a problem if you want to reach out to people, but I also don't know, other than a signature, that you would necessarily have to do that. But that would be based upon your, your decision, that is the board's decision. And quite honestly, giving that advice or direction to the staff, because they're the ones who are receiving these and making the decision on your behalf. Um, it seems to me that there's no, you know, it's very clear there's no requirement for a signature analysis or anything else. So the real question is, what is it that you want staff beyond the signature, if you will, to gig these for as they come in? And then, and then have, if you want to, if there's a procedure, you can establish that here and that way staff can be directed as to how they're supposed to do that. Okay, what are the what's the will of the board? Yeah, my, my sense is that it, it worked well last year where we were able to reach out to folks and let them know, hey, come on in, get your, you know, bring your ID card with you and sign this just so that we didn't reject their ballot on election day. Um, I know some counties did last year and are still uh, weighing ballots to see whether or not there's a secrecy envelope enclosed it in that. That's not, not something we've never done. I don't support that by any means, but, um, but I do think that if we have a ballot that has a signature in it or, or does not have a signature and date in it, we should, be, we should reach out to them and, and say, hey, come on in and, fix, and, and sign this before election day or it won't count. Um, I, I think that's an important, I, I, would, I would think that doing that is, is helpful to the voters. Yeah, I agree. All right, uh, I, I would concur. Uh, is there a motion on the floor? Is there any other, I guess we can have discussion. Is there a motion to uh, to move the procedure forward? I'll make the motion uh, to that effect. I'll second. Okay, properly moved and second. Any, any discussion necessary for the procedure for voters to correct their mail-in ballot envelopes at the Willowbank office building? I do have a question and we may talk about this later. If we do contact them and we don't get a response from people who signed but didn't date, are we just um, sending them to be counted or are we still holding them aside since Betsy said she's not sure that the date is actually required? So, so Betsy, it just, and this is my, you know, uh, uh, this is the, the this is the ballot that I have here. Uh, after Neath or after the date, it says required. And that may be what the form says. So I think if the board wants to say it's required, I I think you I do, will yeah. just tell you that I think people looked at postmarks. I think they looked at other things, and they use that as a date. But if you want to require it, I think you just need to direct staff. There's no rules. I'm not sure if that form came from the state. And yeah. maybe Tish can answer that, or if that's something, but there's nothing specific in the guidance that says you have to have a date. It says you've got to have a signature and you then as the board make a decision on what else and that declaration has to be completed. Okay, all right. If, you, if you're okay with having just the, or just the signature, I, I'm okay with that too. Obviously we, we received them, it, it's, it's come here, so. Yeah, that, Betsy, that was changed by the state, I think, to minimize the problems. But another question is, if it falls down to looking at postmarks, the people that are putting them in a drop box aren't going to be postmarked. It would just have the date it was received here, which obviously, if they were not received in time, it's not even a question. But I just want to clarify, if it's a drop box, no postmark, I guess if you want to give them advice that just roll with I'm stamped then if that's the choice they make. Well, or, or they can say that for those that use the Dropbox, they got to be dated, right? I mean, you, you, you have the ability to make that distinction if the board chooses that. I mean, the advantage of a postmark, obviously, is that things get dated 
when they go through the postal system. So at least you know how that works. But again, it's 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 the board's discretion on how they want to set that up. It seems to me. I would think there's some advantage to either or. In other words, if it comes by mail, there's your postmark. If it if uh, if it's in a drop box, it, it would require a uh, a date. That would be my thought. That sounds good to me. So yeah, I'll, <clears throat> I'll concur. That's yeah. Okay, that so that is that, that is the motion as it stands. Are we okay. in agreement? Yes. Yep. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Unanimous, unanimously passes. And we'll move on to the next one, which is guidelines for accepting and rejecting votes by mail ballots without signatures and or dates, naked ballots, and other potential defects. Yeah, this was, and this is, you know, where we spent a bulk of our time last year uh, after the election, basically going through this category of different kind of permutations for folks who um, either had a naked ballot, wrote on the secrecy envelope, all those type of things. And I think, I think we're still going to be in agreement on most of them, but I think we just wanted to kind of gather together uh, to see if Betsy had any, you know, new information from any court cases that would, would occur. It might be helpful, Betsy, just to talk about the fact that we in Center County did not have any challenges here. And, and there really wasn't anything taken up to a statewide level, I, I think. So um, those were all determined at the, the uh, common pleas level. So uh, I don't know if there's any new information of, uh, uh, related to any of these. Um, but um, the, the, I think, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. talking about mail-in ballots. Yeah, this would be for, yeah. uh, yep, any, any new information related to, uh, you know, if naked ballot, we still have to reject naked ballots. We still reject ballots um, that are, uh, you know, if somebody has written on the secrecy envelope, those type of things. Well, we're, we're definitely still uh, rejecting naked ballots. I mean, that, that, that's a Supreme Court decision. There's been no change to that. And there wasn't a lot of litigation post the election about that specifically, that issue as much as you would like. Most of the litigation is about provisional ballots because what would happen is, so instead of litigating whether they should have or should not have been given provisional ballots, essentially what got litigated was the provisional ballots. And as I look at the process, I mean, it seems to me that it's, it's so we all know this is not a perfect situation and that in, in if we were king for a day, we'd rewrite this code and make it much easier for everybody on this call and not to mention the voters. But it seems to me that there is an argument when you look at the provisional language, which Tish sent over to me as well, um, to suggest that you know, on, this, on the one hand, if they've already voted by mail and returned it, in order to get a provisional ballot, they have to certify that they did not vote. And that, as you mentioned in our call, I think Mike last week was one of the questions we turned over to Bernie. He didn't, you know, he's not gonna go after these folks who are simply trying to vote, but that doesn't necessarily mean that then because they certify that they didn't vote, but they in fact did vote, that you somehow count their ballots. So that's a question one for the board. But two, um, it goes on then to say, so if a voter's return and successfully voted their absentee ballot, they shouldn't vote again. They shouldn't be given a ballot. But if that ballot is rejected by election officials, the voter may cast a provisional ballot. And we get back into that circle where, you know, let's err on the side of caution. Let's let them a provisional ballot out and then you three get to make a decision um so you know my thought is that kind of lets them back in right if they if they if we have made available to poll watchers that there's naked ballots they view them and they want to on their own call these voters and have them come in they certainly can do that i i would just say to all of you i actually had to for a separate actually for our fun little case in the Eastern District that's still hanging out there from the 2020 election. I had to go look at the a couple of these websites where these third parties have done uh, uh, surveys and data analysis because I don't know if anybody, any of you looked at that complaint, but if you like algorithms and all kinds of stuff, you could certainly do that and it would blow your mind. But in any event, um, 
it's very clear to me that voters get confused when they get called. And so one of the things that also happened post the election, not on election day, but post the election is that a lot of voters got calls saying, did you actually vote your absentee ballot? And they and, and it creates confusion. So I would just say to you, I don't I know you can't control people in the vote by mail room, but I would encourage them if they really want to reach out to a voter who has a naked ballot and therefore it won't be counted and tell them to come in and vote provisionally, because that's the step process, that they be very clear on how they communicate that because voters don't like to hear that they they voted or that they're they've done something wrong. I mean. Hopefully we won't have very many naked ballots, but you know, you, you're gonna have them because people just aren't thinking and they they don't they they make a mistake. Um it's no different than you know somebody coming into a polling place and forgetting only voting the first half of their ballot and not the second half. I mean, we don't we don't give them a do-over, right? They they basically go home and when their spouse says, sorry, gentlemen, when their spouse says, Did you turn over the ballot? and they say no. <laughs> They get, you know, oh, they're embarrassed. So I, you know, I don't, again, I don't think we should put our election workers in a position where if somebody comes in and wants to vote a provisional ballot uh, and they are in that district, I think, you know, they're the, the voters, the one that's making the certification that they didn't vote or that there's an issue with their ballot, not the elections, um, the folks at the polling place. But then it, I'm not sure you can make those decisions now without knowing the circumstances of each one. And in fact, in the guidance, and I think you did this last year, Tish, they really recommend that when you get to provisional ballots, you kind of separate them by why people are voting provisionally, and then you can determine how they fall into the category. So maybe more information than you wanted to know, sorry. Yeah, there's check marks on the envelopes that the poll workers are supposed to fill out as to why said individual is casting that ballot. And then when I go through to verify them, I just broke them out into the categories by precinct, whether it was a full count, whether it was rejected and why, whether it was a partial count, just to make things easier. But yes, the poll workers have a spot that they are supposed to check off why this individual is being given a ballot. I don't believe they added a choice for potentially cast naked ballot, but um, you know, um, there's something else that they would have to pick to do that. Well, to maybe just start with the vote by mail ballots and then we can get to the provisionals. Uh, just to review the ones that we, we had, these are the circumstances we had uh, last year. The outer envelope, and you could maybe just say, Betsy, whether or not you would think we should, shouldn't still count them, uh, but the naked ballot. So you're saying naked ballot, we still, per the Supreme Court, we can't count, right? Okay, uh, wrote on the secrecy envelope. Those were the ones that, um, you know, and, and we, we kind of looked the way that we did it was we were looking at the secrecy envelope and saying, well, can we read what they said or not? And from what I've seen recently is where you, you can't make any mark at all. Um, if we still wanted to do it where if we can make out what they're, excuse me, saying in terms of, excuse me, if it's a signature or a, some sort of identifying mark, if we still want to leave that up for uh, discussion once we see them. I didn't know if we wanted to just do a blanket. If there's a mark on it, we don't count it at all. So that's one thing I think we would need to have a discussion on. Um, but the other ones that are very clear that we would not count are the the voter made their own ballot, or I'm sorry, they made their own secrecy envelope, which we did not count any of them. Um, there was also, obviously we can't count a ballot, but we had seven, seven inner envelopes that did not contain any ballots seven. Obviously, we wouldn't count those. And the last one would be they only returned it in the secrecy envelope. And that was where it didn't even go to the vote by mail processing room. It's just stayed at the elections office. And they just held them. They brought them before us. We said none of them are going to count. And we and we adjudic adjudicated them that way. But I think the main one would be, do we want to, do we want to have a position currently where if there's any mark on a secrecy envelope, we don't count it? Or do we say it'll be up for us to determine whether or not it's, it's, um, it reveals their identity, political affiliation, or their candidate preference? So that was one I think we, we might want to have some sort of position on before we, we look at these. So Michael, right, wrong, or indifferent, like traditionally, we always went with the guide 
no identifying marks. So basically, if we know who you are because it is a secret ballot, that was always the way that we did it. Now, of course, you guys are voting to make it however you want, but traditionally in the past, that was the ruling that we went with. Yeah, and I, and I think the dilemma here is that is that I, I, unless it's a stray mark, right? I mean, we all know what a stray mark is, but I think it goes beyond that. I think it has to elevate to you guys because in that vote by mail room, I know you're there, Mike, but the board isn't there. And so to the extent you have any of those, I, I don't know that you can make those decisions in advance. I mean, I think you can say, look, if it's a stray mark, we're not gonna, we're, we're not gonna kick it out. If it's not our official envelope, we are going to reject it, right? Um, you know, those kinds of things. But beyond that, I don't know that you all want to make a blanket decision at the outset, especially since, you know, it, it, that, that to me is kind of like when we get into those provisional categories, that's going to have to come back to you. I mean, there's some things we just can't avoid, I think. But that's my two cents. In that circumstance, what we do is if a extractor in the vote by mail room sees a secrecy envelope that has some sort of mark on it, they would just flag it, fill out a form, and we would hold it. And, uh, and we'll go into this at, at, during the next section, our, our part C of this discussion, but it'll be held at a, at a table specifically until the counting there is done and then it will be brought back to us. So that's the process we would have at this point, and then we would be able to figure out whether or not it would be an identifying mark. Like you said, Betsy, it could just be a circle or a, you know, whatever, but it has to be an identifying mark. So if, if everybody's comfortable with that, we'll, 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 we'll determine whether or not they should count or not um, after the election. Any thoughts, Mike or Mark? Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think Betsy, you know, having a blanket state because because what the problem you're going to get into then is if we do say any mark at all, and then it's clearly not a mark or clearly not identifying, it's gonna it's gonna cause more ballots that we've got to figure out here. So I, I do like what she's saying, where it has to it just can't be a stray mark. I, I I think that's good. Yeah, that's good. I mean, you know, obviously a stray mark, it's not identifiable. There's no real decision involved my goodness let the poor person vote but yeah if they start writing actual letters uh, or numbers then yeah we probably want to look at it all right uh anything else in regard to uh so we're we're clear about naked ballots we're clear about uh when it says other potential defects I think we almost have to take those as we as we move forward. Is is that the general feeling? I I think and again we're 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 going to probably end at about ten thousand five hundred ballots requested. We had thirty six thousand uh, in the general election, so we're going to have fewer issues. I think, and also it's the, it's the third time around we're doing this, so I think we're going to have fewer issues. But I I do I would say that any for any of those things you can't make up or or concoct ahead of time, it would make sense for us to look at them, um, uh, you know, at in the moment. I, I think that does make sense. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to uh, formulate guidelines? Sure. And I will make the motion uh, per the discussion we had about uh, rejecting naked ballots, rejecting ballots that do not have uh, a uh, return envelope with them, uh, and for the ballots that have uh, voter identifiable marks to be determined at an election board meeting after the election. And of course, that applies to the mail-in and absentee ballots. Correct, yeah. Yep, yeah. I will second that motion. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Any other discussion on the guidelines? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, motion passes unanimously, which leads us to letter C, procedures for observers slash washers to view defective envelopes, ballots, and vote by mail processing room. Yeah, I think, and, and maybe we, I apologize for this. We, we didn't specifically have the provisional ballot discussion on here, but it sort of goes along with item B. 
Um, and if we wanted to do provisional ballots, Mr. Chair, now or wait until after we're done with the vote by mail processing room, e either way that you'd like to do it. Uh, we can do them together. Okay, all right. So specifically with the vote by mail ballots, um, just so that we're all on the same page about what we, what we the, the, the new procedure we put in place and any additional things we'd like to have happen there would be, we are going to have two people at all times throughout the five shifts we're doing, three shifts on Tuesday, two shifts on Wednesday, where if any anytime a, an extractor has an issue with one of the ballots or envelopes, they're gonna fill out the form and then that form and ballot are going to go to that we're calling it the issues table. And there's going to be two people there the whole day uh, who are just going to be monitoring those uh, those issue ballots, making sure that they're safely guarded. Nothing's happening to them. They're in good hands. We didn't specifically have a table last year. We All those issue forms went to the empty envelope team and they had a table for them, but they were busy. Uh, you know, verifying the envelopes were empty where they weren't actually looking at them. Going forward, we're just going to have somebody, two people there the whole time, watching those, organizing them, making sure they're, they're again, uh, safely kept. So the question is, there's two questions uh, that I wanted to make sure we all were aware of. Number one, can observers, the, the, watcher, the watchers and the observers that'll be let in the room as candidate representative, party representatives, et cetera, can they look at those? Can they can they see those those uh, ballots with either you know the the voters' information on them? You know what what level of access should they have? That's number one. And then number two is if they do have access to them and they can see what the voter the voter's name or you know or information, can they take a picture? Um, or not with their phone. And the thinking would be, we could just say they can write it down, but they can't take a picture of it. Um, so those are those are the questions. I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page about them. And then what we would, and then the thinking behind this as well is, we would tell all the watchers that are in that room, if you would like to see any of the ballots that have issues with them, you can go to this table and this table will have them and you can look at them at whatever frequency. Um, but if the decision of the board is to say they can't look at them, then we would uh, inform the watchers they're not able to look at them and not able to take pictures or, or write down any information. So I wanted to have that discussion before we went through this again uh, you know, a week from now. Betsy, what's your, what's your pleasure on this? Well, I think having looked at, and I haven't looked at as closely as I might, but I'll, let me just say to you, the watcher cases, the watcher cases were all not, are not necessarily precedential on us because there are other counties. But when I read what the judges did, the key was that everybody gets treated equally. So I would agree one, they should not be allowed to photograph the ballots. In fact, we just got guidance back on a right to know request that makes very clear that they can't, you know, they really aren't supposed to get that information. So they can't, they couldn't photocopy it, but I think they could get the name of the voter and the information and the persons, persons who are manning that could actually provide it to them, right? Um, and I think as long as you set out from the get-go at 7 a.m. to those watchers that this information is there, their decision to or not to is not a problem as long as the access is all equal. Center County was in a very unique situation among counties that had um, large volumes of absentee ballots because you had taken the, the step of putting yourself in a location where you could have a lot of people. Now, I mean, I know that Philadelphia, they were in the convention center. I'm not sure that in Phil Philadelphia is an exception unto itself. I'm not sure they could ever have been anywhere and handled that. But other counties certainly could have if they chose to. And there were a lot of counties who did allow watchers much more access than, say, Philadelphia and some others, um, much access similar to what Center County did. The key is, I, I think, Mike, you know, you, you, you even to the point of having an informational sheet that each watcher gets that says, these are the stations, this is where they are. And that way, nobody can say, I wasn't aware. And as long as it's equal and fair, I think the board is definitely protected 
Um, if somebody comes back and says, well, you know, I, I didn't go over and ask about that. Well, that's okay. We told you where it was. We gave you access. You chose not to do certain things. Yeah. So I guess, I guess my question would be, is it something that you can just randomly walk up and say, hey, what do you have? Or are there assigned times with, that they're available for review? How, how do you think it should work? Because you don't want you don't want people bothering the uh, the workers over there, you know. Somebody looked at them, and then five minutes later, somebody else comes up and looks at them. I mean, what's what? What do you want the process to look like? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, uh, you know, maybe it's on on the hour, or you know, the, the first ten minutes of every hour, they can walk over and see if there's anything that's been deposited there or something like that. Any thoughts, gentlemen? Yeah, no, that's, I think that's a good idea where, um, and, and maybe this would even be a hybrid where as issues come over, instead of having a watcher have to take a picture or write something down and actually have to see the, the application, we could simply put the person's name on a sheet of paper and just write it down um, where, and then maybe a notation on if it was a naked ballot, if it was a uh, you know, whatever, you know, whatever the issue was, we could notate it next to it um, so that then we don't have to worry about any of the watchers having to take a picture, or write down the information and kind of huddling around there. It would just be on a sheet of paper. And in addition, anytime we get a, um, you know, and it could be on the hour. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great idea where it's, um, you know, or it could just be a running list. Um, I, I do like the on the hour thing. That, that's um, certainly doable. And maybe it's a combination, Mike. I like the idea of having them create a running list and that, that you just tell watchers they can go over, you know, on the hour and they can look at that list and it's, it's just a running list. So they, you know, they, that means somebody coming later gets the list that starts at the beginning of the day, but it also means that there's no question about anybody having to look at a ballot or get information, right? You could, however, take a photo of the list. Am I correct? If that's okay, if, if we're comfortable with yeah, that. I, I yeah, I think that's okay. I think what you would put on the list is the person's name and maybe their precinct, or I don't know if you even want to give them that, but, you know, I, I don't think it's a problem to say Betsy Dupuy, Patton North One, you know, or Elizabeth, because if you said Betsy, that would, I don't, I don't get that, but, you know, I don't think that's a problem. Um, and I think you're right, Steve, then they could take a picture of it and it wouldn't be a problem. I, my advice is that we, uh, since, it, since this is a week out, can we allow Betsy the, the latitude to uh, provide us with specific direction for the, uh, for the workers in the, in, the, uh, in the vote by mail room? Oh, yeah. We're, uh, in terms of those, uh, are you talking about in terms of the issue ballots and how those are, are done? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Something very simple for the for the so the the workers there have have it in concrete what it is they are allowed is supposed to do. Yeah, I I'm happy to uh, work with Betsy on that. We have some we have some things that we had last year we created for them, but we can refresh them so that they're aware of what they're what they're doing and what they're not doing. Absolutely. But essentially what we're going to be doing is creating a list and making it available on the hour that will indicate the voters and the voters precinct if available. Uh, and that's about the information we're going to provide them. Is that is that correct? Uh, I, I Go ahead, Bessie. I was going to mention something after you're done. No, I don't have anything to add. I'm fine. Okay. Uh, it may make sense to... to... So the only real time that we would have a voter, I'm trying to think how to say this. Uh, the only time that we would have a voter who would, we would know that they made, an, they had an issue, like for example, uh, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to best how to say this. I don't know if we would want to put an issue because here's the thing, if we're going to have watchers there coming up and it says Mike Pipe, Bullsburg and, or Harris Township, they might want to know what my issue is because if they're going to call people and say, 
you know, your ballot wasn't counted, the voter might want to know why. That would be my only thinking about maybe we would want to we would want to give some context about there being either a naked ballot or um, an identif you know I gets tricky it gets tricky that's what that's what I'm trying to say is uh, is us giving giving out information um, how how practical is that Betsy to to be able to do how many different how many different uh, categories do you want to create. In terms of what's on the list? If my name is on the list and my precinct is behind it, how many categories would be appropriate to identify the problem with the, uh, with the ballot? Well, I mean, I don't think, I would think the only people that would be on that list would be naked ballots. I mean, I don't know why, I mean, <sighs> Or if they make a mark on their envelope, Betsy. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess you could say, you know, I mean, you could just call them rejected ballots, right? And then you don't have to get into what the issue is. And then, you know, people can call them and say your ballot was rejected, but we don't know the reason, right? So we suggest you would go vote provisionally. I mean, that would be the argument. Um, I don't know if that, I don't know that they need to know the reason. I mean. Because I, I don't think you want to set that voter up where they come into the polling place and say to our election staff, hey, you rejected my ballot because you said, and they're like, we didn't reject your ballot. We don't even know what's going on. So I think saying this is a list of rejected ballots, name, precinct is all you would provide. That's my two. Name and precinct and that is a rejected ballot and uh if I were a poll watcher or whatever, the, the only re the only remedy would be to vote provisionally. Is that what you're suggesting? Yes. Yeah, yep. that would be it. Okay. I'm fine that, with that. Okay, that sounds good. Then then we'll just we'll just have that again. Name precinct. That's it. Name precinct, right? And that list will be will be compiled and available on the hour. Is that what? So everything that happens between seven and seven fifty nine, you know, as, as quickly as they can compile a list, it will be available eight o'clock or soon after. Yeah, I thought that that's more than more than doable. Yep, absolutely. So that way you can go over and you know they can take photographs, they can take photographs of the list and do with it as they please. Is it okay? Everybody know that the stuff that we discussed on Tuesday to get guidance and confirmation, I did email the state. I have not heard back yet. So as soon as I do, I will let everyone know on whether the policies and procedures put into place, the guidance from November is still in place. If it is, can you please, you know, confirm exactly what it is? Um, I will keep everybody updated when I get an answer. And then one other thing, one other question would be, can, is it okay if we keep a running tally of the total amount that wouldn't that would have been issues that, that we might not be able to determine the voter or not? For example, by the time we get to a secrecy envelope and we open it up and it's empty, we're not going to know that we're not going to know what voter that's attached to. Therefore, it wouldn't go on this list we're going to create every hour. Excuse me, but it might make sense for us to at least tell a watcher, excuse me, they might ask, well, how many ballots? or how many envelopes total do you have that have issues with them, it's going to differ. So if it's okay, we could also keep track of how many total uh, ballots or envelopes have issues so that uh, we just are, are publicizing that as well. I think that might be helpful um, as well. But again, they won't have names attached to them. Do you want to, do you want to signify those as unidentifiable? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yep, that's what we could do. Oh, I see what you mean. Where, okay, yeah. So on the on the uh, list, it would just say no voter attached or, um, um, yeah, I don't know, Betsy, if you'd, you'd want to, if there's another word for that, but I, I think I know what you mean, Steve, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about this. I mean, so, you know, Let's just talk this through so we know what we have. I mean, so clearly a naked ballot is rejected, right? So we know those are rejected. I suppose 
you know, if somebody's name is written on the outside of their secrecy ballot, we're going to say those are rejected, right? Because that's an identifying mark. And then I think you get into what I'll call the gray areas of identifying marks, which may or may not reject the ballot, right? That those, there could be some of those that come to you for a decision. And so, you know, you've got clear rejected ballots, you've got ballots that the, we'll just say the staff has questioned maybe, or, um, and I'm not sure I want to use the word questionable ballots, but, you know, we could come up with a, um, or maybe potentially rejected. So there's rejected, potentially rejected, and what it, I'm, I'm trying to think of a word to use for what you were talking about, Steve, um, not, not identified. That my only my only concern is somebody's going to say, "Well, okay, what's the deal with them?" The non-identified, right? right. Well, how well, about we just Any, how about we just see. call them? Because you're not going to have a name with those. Why wouldn't we just have a category that's called empty secrecy envelope? Because you're not going to have a name associated with that. So that list will have to be separate, or that accounting would have to be separate. But the list that this table would have is. Um, Elizabeth Dupuy, Patton North One, rejected or, or you know, potentially rejected, um, you know, something like that. Yeah, I, 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 I'd like to potentially, uh, potentially uh, rejected because that way, you know, they, they can't adjudicate it there on the floor. They, they have right. to come before the election. Right, right. Right. I mean, clearly naked ballots, I think they can adjudicate on the floor. If they're naked, they're done. They're toast. Um, but to the other side of the extreme, which is an empty envelope, I don't, you're not going to have a voter name with that. So you're just going to have a track, a number of, you know, that can be kept. You could keep that old skill, skill, school with a crosshatch, you know, yep. on uh, empty envelope, empty secrecy envelope, you know, one, two, three, four, slash, one, two, three, four, slash. I mean, other than that, there's no way to, you're not gonna trail them back to anybody. Right, and the only, the, so you covered both, which is the inner envelope has a mark. Uh, inner envelope does not contain a ballot. The third one, which we had some of is the ballot is cut or torn, where it was either done by the, by the open, as the extractors were opening it. Luckily this year, we've got larger envelopes. So we're not gonna have as many issues with that. But we did have a few ballots that were cut by the, or the voter just it was cut by the voter or they ripped it in half and we just put it in and it's not necessarily that we're rejecting the ballot it's just that we made the decision last year not to remake any ballots in the room which i would agree with us not doing this year as well we would remake them in 146 but that would be another thing that we could count as well how many ballots were, were sliced um, or cut. And again, it doesn't mean we're rejecting them. It just means that it's going to the elections board for, for more review. Okay. So how do you want, again, we're, we're back to this. Oh, process. I'm sorry. What, what I'm, I'm, see as a problem? No, I'm sorry. So what we would do is we just had three check marks or, uh, you know, dashes or line dashes, which would be for three categories. Inner envelope has a mark. Inner ballot does not contain a ballot. Inner, inner envelope doesn't contain a ballot or ballot is sliced or cut. So basically we, we would just check off how many we receive uh, in that category and report that every hour. Okay. How's but that would, sound, Betsy? But you wouldn't assign names to those because nope. you're not gonna know where they go. Right, Correct. I gotcha, okay, yep. gotcha, yep. And will that uh, pass legal scrutiny, Betsy, I guess is the yeah, question. I, no, I think, look, I think having a process actually helped you a lot in Center County that you guys had thought through some of these issues. And I, I realize this all got thrown at us at the last moment, but I think that really helped. And the fact that you made things available. So not only beforehand, you know, on election day, but, you know, afterwards you had all those meetings and folks could be there and be available. I think that really helped. Um, you know, there were other counties that chose to do things for a different reason. I'm not going to judge them or why they did it, but, you know, I think it, uh, I mean, certainly you guys did very well on the provisional ballot side. I had counties that had thousands of provisional ballots challenged for a variety of issues. I mean, and, and some of them I would call 
would have been traditional provisional ballots where people just, um, you know, we talked about this on the call the other day, Tish, you know, they were in the wrong place. Uh, they thought that's where they were registered to vote. It was, you know, they were given a provisional ballot. You know, there's there's leeway under the code to do that. And it, people just decided to challenge every, once they started challenging, they challenged everything. So, yeah. I, I will, I should add here, I know we're gonna jump to talk about provisionals. Um, I, I kind of looked over that statute again. Um, you know, I really think, I mean, in, and we've always operated as a board and I think that this premise is shared by probably better than half of your brethren election board members across the Commonwealth, that you, you apply the provisional ballot rule very liberally, mostly to protect your election workers from people who think that they should be able to vote where they are. That being said, I think if you have somebody who clearly is not registered to vote in Center County, you, you have no obligation under the law to give them a ballot. Even under HAVA, um, they, they need to be registered in Center County. And that probably only applies generally to the folks on campus, but you've had a couple outliers, you know, in some of our outlying um, municipalities where they just haven't managed to get their, get their voter registration redone. Uh, but again, if they're registered to vote and they're there, then that's a different issue than somebody coming in and, and they're, they're not registered here, but they're registered in Montgomery County or somewhere like that. So, and maybe we have, give... we have we ever had a situation where there was an error on our part in regard to the, the registration or where, you know, where they belong, because I think we have, and, and the idea of disenfranchising somebody I think is very acute. So. No, I, I, and I think we had that issue in the fall, Steve. We got to complain about that. I mean, I, I don't know if it's, I mean, I, I think for the most part, your election judges, if they look at the book and they look at their system, they call and then it becomes incumbent upon us in the office to find it. I mean, you know, it may be Tish that we need to make sure that those kinds of calls go to the people who really know how to search the system and answer the question correctly and not end up with a quick answer. I mean, because uh, you guys, Tish, know that system inside and out. And I know even when I was looking up stuff, I you know, had to come to you a couple of times and say, you look up this person and see if you can find them because I can't. Right, and we do instruct, well, in the past, and it still kind of carries over even though the professional things have changed. We have always instructed the poll workers to call us if a provisional was being issued, because there is a lot of research that needs to go into it, um, because sometimes it falls on a different county, they didn't process the application and they should have. So in that instance, you know, we do, yes, do your provisional because it would inevitably be counted because in the interim, we'll call that county, we'll say, you know, you need to get this voter to us. If there was something that happened um, on the county level, we can look into that and we can also remedy that so that their provisional would be counted, but it is better to be able to look into it because even applications that come in late, they are all alphabetized so that we can go right to them to look and see, yes, you did submit a registration, but unfortunately it was after the deadline. Um, you know, it is always better to be able to put the research into it because the last thing you want to do is have them do the provisional only to then be told, oh yeah, well, you're not registered or you, you didn't go to the right precinct when maybe they would have liked to drive to where they're properly registered so that the entire ballot would all be a full count, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I just What's from my sense- the board right now? Oh no, from my, from my sense, we, we give a provisional ballot out to anybody who asks for one. We're, we're probably gonna have very few uh, non-registered, you know, the, as we typically think of the students. Um, but the challenge is going to be, we're gonna, I think we're gonna have a considerable amount of provisional ballots that are gonna emanate, em, that are gonna emanate from um, uh, people who have not returned their ballot, their vote by mail ballots in yet. And so the, the poll workers should just, you know, they're, they're gonna be giving out a, a number of provisional ballots, I think. And so, but if they wanna call you to double check, but I just don't want them saying no to somebody. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt for somebody to vote provisionally. That's no, they wouldn't just out, outright say no to them because they're instructed to call us. So 
So they're not going to just say, nope, that's the end of the end of the road. Nope, you're not getting one. Well, no, that that would be what we would do if we would if we would confirm they're not registered to vote here in Center County. Gotcha. No, yeah. So I, what I'm saying, you know, I agree with you, uh, Tisha, but I'm saying I don't think we should go down that path quite yet. I don't think there's too many instances where that will happen. I don't think it's going to be over. It's not going to be overly taxing in a municipal election. Let's 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 put our heads together and come up with a process moving forward, uh, even after this election, where we actually have a system for this and maybe have a specific point person to do the, the legwork. To make sure, you know, because I agree with Mike, I, I hate to disenfranchise somebody from voting, and uh, I think that's that. I, I I think it makes us look look a lot better if we make a reasonable effort to uh, provide them with a provisional ballot, even if it it seems nonsensical. Yeah, and I think that's right, Steve. And I think under HAVA, um, which is the federal statute, I think you're you get lots of kudos because you are trying to help people vote. I think the critical piece is that they need to understand that, you know, so whoever's giving it to them, just because they get a provisional ballot doesn't mean that you ultimately as a board are going to allow that vote to be cast. That's that pro that promise is never made. What what it, what it is, is they're given the opportunity to cast a ballot. It may or may not qualify. Okay, I gotcha. And I believe me, it's not lost on me that it's a pain in the rear, but I will tell you, uh, I, I think it I, I think it creates a better will out there if you have a few extra provisionals. Absolutely. Oh, we'll work and, on that. Now no, I absolutely. And that's really the intent of the and that's the intent of the federal law is that you would allow more people, you, you would be more helpful to voters than not. So I think, Steve, that makes perfect sense. That's my thought. Uh, Mark, do you have do you have any appreciation of this? Yeah, I I think we should lean much more toward handing out the provisional ballots than trying to uh, save a couple of pennies in printing. If, if somebody really wants a provisional ballot, <clears throat> fine. We'll determine whether it's valid or not later. Okay. Uh, I forgot where we stand on the process to <laughs> adopt this. Well, I think I think, and I think it was just more of a general discussion to make sure we're all on the same page to continue what we're doing. I think the only thing, in addition, is uh, to check in with Betsy to see if there's any been any changes related to the two signature requirement on the outside of a provisional ballot envelope. We had a few uh, judges that did not implement that during the November election, and this would just be to make sure that. We're still on the same page that a provisional ballot must be in a, in a secrecy envelope and have been signed at minimum twice by the voter. And um, uh, I know the elections office has done a great job to bring, bring everybody up to speed. The judges on how to make sure a provisional ballot is complete, ensuring that all precincts have the appropriate materials they need to uh, vote, vote with a provisional ballot and to include an instructional sheet on there. Uh, so, um, so anyway, yeah, just uh, basically just to have a discussion about that to make sure that we're all on the same page. Is is the right. is the is the form that's used on the provisional ballot set by the Commonwealth? Yes. Okay. Because you know, it's odd because the. I don't quite know why they do that because nothing talks, at least what I could find, talks about two signatures, right? A before and after signature, which is essentially what we do. It just says that the signature of the signature singular of the elector on the affidavit is mandatory. And in fact, the signature of the judge of elections is not mandatory. So I, I don't know. I mean, the question is, you know, when you talk about rejecting a ballot, you're not only supposed to reject it if the information is necessary to determine 
whether they were eligible to vote, you know? So, I mean, is this, is it, is two signatures make you eligible versus one? Um, I, Tish, do you know, I mean, is there a reason why we make them sign both ways? I do not have the 100% answer. I just know that, so the form has, was recently formatted, reformatted. Um, and I think that they always had to sign before and after, but the design of the envelope changed. Um, give me one second to pull it up and see specifically what the mention is of the wording for before and after. Because it's interesting, HABA doesn't require two signatures. The federal law doesn't require it. It says they just have to have signed somewhere. Uh, it, this is a, the declaration. Of course, it could be in other states. And again, see, this might be something we want to talk about later as opposed to for this election, but, you know, depending on what we want to look at, it could be in other states that the affidavit to get the provisional ballot is separate and apart from the ballot itself. And whereas in Pennsylvania, we put it all on one document. Okay, Betsy, the, the first signature that they signed before receiving the ballot, the the oath essentially is, I do solemnly swear or affirm that my name and date of birth are as I have listed above. And at the time that I registered, I resided at the address I have provided above in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And that this is the only ballot that I have cast in this election. The oath essentially they sign after receiving and voting the ballot is, I declare under penalty of law that I am a properly registered voter in this election district indicated in my affidavit and that I am eligible to vote in this election in this election district. So that's the, the, the two variations and what they're signing. Why they didn't make it all one, I'm not sure, but. And we don't have any further guidance from the Commonwealth, right? No, that was one of the things that I had asked for. Um, the most recent thing is the thing that I had forwarded to you guys the other day that we got in the email around November. I don't think anything was notated in that though. I mean, it, it could be always where we're where this is something that we can re do more research on and discuss, uh, you know, after the what you know when we're processing the provisional ballots, we still have you know a, a week and a few days until we're going to be processing them and working through those. Yeah, I mean, I I think the question I, I don't know how you can make a decision up front about this without seeing the circumstances, but you know, I I don't and I don't even remember. If they didn't have both signatures, did we reject them in the fall? I think the answer is yes, but I can't remember that. Yes, we, we did. If they didn't have both, we rejected them. Okay. Yeah. I mean, my assumption is Pennsylvania is treating this the same way they would if you apply for an absentee ballot. So you fill out application one to get the ballot, you sign that, you, even if you now it's electronic, admittedly. And then you come back and you get the ballot and you sign the outside of the ballot. And so we're trying to mimic that through the process. So, it, you know, on that theory, both signatures would be required. The problem is voters don't understand that. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a convoluted process, but I think we just got to really impress upon our judges of election that they've really got to say, no, you've really got to do this both times, not just once, and hope they get it right. Okay, any other discussion required? Any other actions required? I don't think I don't think for this one, I think once we, you know, once we see the ballots or provisional ballot issues we have, um, we can discuss more, but um, uh, Tisha, I don't know if you could talk just, just so we have it on the record, a little bit about what has been done with each provisional ballot pack 
for each of the judge of elections? Sure. So this time, the chart that was used to determine how many provisional ballots were actually going to be ordered for each precinct, that same amount of materials is packaged for that particular precinct. And all the materials are packaged together in their own little packet, the outer envelope, the secrecy envelope, the receipt. So literally, it's one for one. They, they take one little packet. They're also in the poll worker manual, and they have two copies in the judge's envelope. There is a um, flow chart telling them if this is what it says in the signature block, you know, did they bring the ballot? If the answer is yes, this is how you proceed. If the answer is no, this is how you proceed. And then the other notations that print in the poll book also pertaining to ballots, it's the same thing. It shows you the header of what prints. Did they do this? If the answer is yes, do these. If the answer is no, do these. And there's pictures. So we've made it absolutely as positively clear as we can for them. And there also is going to be a copy of that also in well in with the provisional balloting materials. So there's multiple things that have been done to hopefully ensure that everything's being done that needs to be done. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh... Any other discussion required for the uh, for the last uh, batch of points? If not, we'll uh, we'll address them uh, as we traditionally have and uh, do them on a case by case basis. If that's if that's the consensus. That sounds good. Thank you. All right. Uh, any items for discussion today? I, I nothing else from me. No. Uh, I'm good. Any, any anything from the elections office that you any questions that you have or clarifications that you require before the uh, elections next week? Not that I'm aware of, but if something pops up, we can um, shoot out an email. Okay. Well, hopefully, it won't require official action, and because we'll have to do it on uh, Tuesday morning, otherwise. So. Yeah, so does that Unless mean you're going to cancel have, Thursday's meeting? Oh, do we have it? Do we have a meeting on Thursday? We have it as a placeholder in case anything came up. Um, and that's fine. Okay, I just well, want to clarify. We'll, yeah. We'll, All right. I, we'll leave it on there just in case. Okay. Thank you. Anything else that we can think about today before uh, before we adjourn? No, nothing I have. Not. Uh, we would entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. I'll second the motion. <clears throat> okay. Any other discussion before we adjourn at 205? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We're adjourned at 205. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll talk to you very soon. Thank you.